So that's the Python version of a list. Arrays are different. They are fixed. And this is true of Java as well. They're fixed in length. They are accessed by their index number, by their subscript. That's true. They are contiguous in memory, meaning that if there's a value, you know, the first element is stored in this value, and the next one will be right after that in memory, and the next one will be right after that in memory, which makes processing them in a language that addresses them like that really, really fast. Whereas in a list, it's actually behind the scenes a linked list, meaning it has to hop around in memory in order to find the next element. So an array is the fastest data structure. What is it? It's a series of values. Let me actually define one for our language. int l subscript in subscript is equal to curly brace, not, not square braces, 1 comma 5 comma 9, like that. That would make an array that is of three in length. It's got three elements. You could make it have a thousand elements if you want to. Well, you wouldn't necessarily want to type in a thousand elements. When you create your array, you can stick a number between the square braces. That number is a number of elements in it. So if you want to create an array that's a thousand items long, you'd say int l subscript a thousand. And you probably wouldn't want to put a thousand you know, numbers between curly braces, but conceivably you could. So the elements that you can print out, L subscript 0 is the number 1. L subscript 1 is the number 5. L subscript 2 is the number 9. It's called zero-based indexing. So if you have 10 elements, you'll start counting them at 9, and you go 0 to 9. We have three elements, so we go 0 to 2, and 10. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Adds up to 10 elements. So kind of like n minus 1, or length minus 1. Is there a length function in C that will tell you the length of an array? No, absolutely not, unfortunately. So you have to keep track of that length yourself. When you define your array, you might define a constant, which stands for length. Something like this. Constant int a length is equal to, you know, 1,000. And then when you declare your array, int, I shouldn't have used l up there because I use l for my lists. So, you know, an array of ints ain't, is a length, like that. And I'm going to do this. We don't need a thousand of them if we just want to set them all to zero. If you do that, it'll initialize the first value to zero, and then the next 999 of them will automatically go to zero. If we did this, if we changed it to 1, comma 2, the first element would be set to 1, the second element would be set to 2, and the next 998 would be set to 0. So if your initializer list is not as long as the length of the array, all the rest of them will be set to 0. So this is a really fast way of initializing all your data to 0. Why would you do that? Because in C, if you declare an array but you don't initialize it, it doesn't got good data in it. I guess I'm going to pop open Visual Studio for ease of use here. Feel free to open whatever editor if you're going to open an editor. File, oh come on. File, new, project. It's a empty project. July 9, I hope everybody had a a fun, safe, relaxing break, whatever you were doing. Now I'm going to add a C file to it. So right click on source files, add new item. Call it july9.c.
Alrighty. Let me guess, I don't have a boilerplate document ready to go. Sure would be nice if I did. Oh, all right, type it in. Pound sign include <coughs> standard io.h, into main, system pause, but only if you're using Windows, and only if you're not using SIGWIN. In other words, only if you're using Visual Studio. All right, and then return zero. All right. I'm going to declare an array, but I'm not going to put any data in it. And then we're going to print it out. So int ai for an array of ints. It's going to be five elements long. Why don't we be good boys and girls and declare that as a constant? a lin equals five. Const space int space a lin equals five. And I'm going to declare my array int space ai parentheses a lin end parenthesis, uh, excuse me, square braces. Now what have I done wrong? Why am I getting an underscore there? Expression must have a constant of value. Well, it sure looks like a constant to me. Is it of an unknown size? It is not. Okay, fine. I'll initialize it. Just got very confused here. What if I take that out? Are you going to work then? Yeah. What if I put a value in there? A 5. Why can't I put A L E N in there? Well, for Pete's sake, I'm going to make it a pound define and worry about that later. Pound define A L E N 5. And I'm going to move my pound to find above me. Since I was declared as a constant, I should not have been getting any grief about it. I don't know if that's a Microsoft specific thing or if I'm just spacing out. Okay. But I don't want to initialize it to anything because I want the point of this was to print it out. All right. It's five elements long. I'm going to use a for loop to print out those five elements. For, well, I need an integer. I'm just going to use i for index. For i is equal to 0, i is less than a l e n, i plus plus. Not system.printf, I'm not doing Java. Printf percent d. backslash t for a tab, comma, ai subscript i, subscript being the square braces. And after our for loop is done, I want to print out a blank line. Since I don't have a slash in in that printf statement, it's, it's not going to go to the next line. All the numbers will be in one row. So printf backslash in. Alrighty. When I ran it, I got some unfriendly looking numbers. Now, Microsoft C compiled in debug mode initializes memory with a very specific odd looking value. Eyeballing it, I'm not sure exactly what that value is. I mean, you know, how they came up with it. If we compiled it in, D in release mode, then it wouldn't take the time to initialize memory with that. The reason to give the, this very specific invalid value is so that if you were debugging your program, that number would jump out at you. Yeah, there'd be no question that, oh, you'd go, oh, that's an uninitialized uh, value. I know what's wrong with that. But I'm going to change my debug re compile to release. So I'm going to go up here and choose release, rebuild it.
Start it without debugging. All right, and there we go. See, we don't have any way of predicting what those values will be. It's garbage data. It's just whatever happened to be in those bytes before we created the array. So when you allocate an array, you definitely want to initialize it. A couple of different ways of initializing it. The easiest is just to add the little initializer and say, okay, I want every I I want it to be zeroed out. Why didn't they make that the default behavior? As soon as you create an array, it's empty. Speed. What if you don't need the uh, 10,000 pieces of data to be initialized because later on you're going to read them from a file or something? You don't want the computer taking the time to reset all those bytes to zero. And C is designed, you know, to uh, be very fast. And so it's only going to waste the time initializing. It's only going to take the time to initialize it if you specify that you want it. So that's one way. Now when I run it, it prints out all zeros, and I'm much happier. Another way to do it is with a loop. You see this loop that prints it out? We could write a loop that would initialize it. Let's write a loop that will initialize it. It could just even be a while loop. Let's set i equal to 0, and then let's go while i, and I better slow down and make sure everybody's caught up. Let me type this first. While i is less than a len, ai subscript a len plus plus is equal to 0, or whatever value we wanted to fill it up with. And that's a mistake. It's not supposed to be a len there. It's supposed to be i there. AI subscript I plus plus. I'm going to change that to a one just so that when it runs, I can see some pieces of data in it rather than all zeros. All right, and they're all ones. <clears throat> this looks like a slightly odd way of doing a while loop, perhaps, combining the update the increment with the calculation itself, but it's totally legal. And if you start digging into C code online or you know you have coworkers writing C, you're going to see that style of loop processing a lot. All I would have had to do to avoid that is to put a curly brace and then make the uh, I plus plus on a line all by itself. I hope that makes sense. I could have done that. I could have done this. Right, and it would behave just the same. Or I plus plus. Wouldn't matter which way I did it. It matters a lot if I do it in one line like that. Because we don't want I incremented until after this processing is done. And that's why we used a suffix version of increment rather than the prefix. All right, I better hit the PowerPoint and make sure. Well, I better make sure that everybody's got it running. If you're trying to get it to work, nobody <clears throat> get it to work. So if you make your array, you always have to specify the number? No, but it's one or the other. You either have to initialize it explicitly with the number of elements you want, in which case you can leave A len the length out, or if you're not going to use the initializer list or you're going to only give a partial initializer, you better specify it. So if you put in 10 items here separated <clears throat> by commas, it will automatically give you Tip. Now, a string is just an array. Let's define a character array called name or something like that. Care name is equal to Bob. Now, let's print it out. Print F, and it's a string, so I'm going to use percent %s. I'm going to use a backslash n. And heck, why don't I do name equals percent %s, just so I can really know what it's doing. Now it's going to print out Bob. Big surprise. Underneath it, it's an array of characters. It's exactly like that array of ints. You can iterate through it with a, uh, with a for loop. 
or a while loop. I equals zero, while I is less than the length of the array. You think it's only three characters long. It's really four characters long. So I'm going to make it I less than four. Is there no function that counts the length of the array? There is one. There is one. But I'm setting it up like this for a reason. And then we'll use the function from now on if we want. Okay. okay. So, and then printf. Um, why don't we print out the number, the index, followed by the value. But instead of a character value, let's print out the ASCII value of it. Yeah, i is less than 4. Correct, correct, correct. And so printf percent %d, percent %d, I want to print out i, and I want to print out name subscript i. And I forgot to put plus plus on it, so it's an infinite loop. I plus plus. I'm trying to be too clever. All right, and there are printed out BOB, but the last value in it is a zero. It's called a null terminated string. That's how C knows where the end of it is. So every string you create, this is three, so it actually did a four there so that it could tuck in a zero on the end. Now, when we were printing it out, we didn't necessarily want to see that three. I mean, uh, that zero there. So we would probably make that i is less than three. And, you know, then it doesn't really matter how long this is. It's still only going to print out BOB. -B. Now, there's a, another way of doing this. If you're using strings and no other kind of array, there's a function that'll get you the length of it. And it's in the string.h library. And it's possible that Microsoft has included that by default. It's called stringlen, S-T-R-L-E-N. So here's what I could do. S-T-R-L-E-N parentheses name. And stringlen of this will not return 10. What it does is it counts how many characters there are before the null. So the length of that string, according to that function, is 3, which is what we want. We want to only print out three characters. And like I said, I have no idea whether we need to include string.h for Microsoft Studio or not. Yeah, that works. But... For other compilers, you can't guarantee that, so I'm going to come up here to the top and do pound sign include string dot h. Okay, so please remember that. Please remember that all strings in C are terminated by a null, and so you actually have to have one extra space in your length for it. If you're going to store the word Fred in a string, it better be five characters long rather than four because it needs the null at the end. And it uses that null to know when to stop processing. We could write, string, we could write a stringlin function of our own, and all it would do is it would keep processing until it found a null. Let's, let's mimic that. Just copy that code paste it, and change this i is less than stringlin. Do this. While name subscript i is not equal to 0. Both of those will provide the same output. Both print out the ASCII values of, of Bob.
And there we go. Am I seeing that it didn't print it out? The, mm. I thought I had two print statements. Oh, you know what I did wrong here? Um, does anybody see what I did wrong? What kind of moronic mistake I made? What is I equal to by the time we get to here? It's equal to three or four, whatever. Um, probably three. So we need to reset it back to zero. And if I just made this a for loop so we initialized it every time, that would have been better. And there we go. So why does this one work? Because it's using the zero as an indicator that it's hit the end of the array. And once it finally finds an element that is equal to zero, it stops. It exits a while loop. Now, you can't guarantee that for other arrays unless you just decide that's going to be a rule and you always put a zero at the end of your array to serve as a marker. C doesn't give you a function for returning the length of arrays. You can get the length of an array under certain circumstances, but otherwise you should create a constant that contains it. And I'll show you what I mean by under certain circumstances. If I do this, um, let's do an array of floats or doubles. AD, double AD, and just give it some numbers. 1.1, 2.2, And if I want to calculate the length of that array, calling it island because it's an integer and it's containing a length. It's equal to the size of the array as a whole divided by the size of one of the elements of the array, AD subscript 0. And I'm getting an error here. Expect Oh, I forgot my equal sign. It island equals. Now that works in certain circumstances. And that circumstance is specifically if we're in the same scope. If we're using this size of method in the same block of code that declared the array, that's totally cool. But if you pass the array to another function, then that size of trick no longer works. And honestly, I don't completely understand why. Um, the compiler will even warn you about it if you've got w dash, you know, dash w all, and I bet the Microsoft one will too. So just remember that this isn't always available to you. You can use this to calculate the size of the array, but only if it's in the same scope as where the array was declared, dot as a parameter to a function. So what you ought to do is to declare a constant that didn't work for us. Constant. AD len constant int AD len is equal to three and then let's declare another array AD2 subscript AD ln why is that not working expression must have a constant value well what do you think that is is anybody using um, SIGWIN or is everybody using Official Studio? Well, I guess I'll pop open uh, SIGWIN. All righty. LS start at C.
Okay then. It should be working. It's not. So I'm going to continue doing the cheese ball thing of pound sign to find AD lin equals 3. Whatever. Why are we doing that? Oh, remove the equals, remove the semicolon because that's not how you define things with a preprocessor. You just define them by the word and then the replacement value. That's how you define the macro. Okay. Why am I doing that? So that I can pass it around and I can use it in while loops and for loops and stuff like that. Because if unless it's a string, I don't have a, a string lin function. And unless it's a string, I can't depend upon the last element being a zero. So for parentheses, let's print it out. I is equal to zero. I is less than ADLEN. I plus plus. Print F percent D. Let's mess with this a little bit. Let's use a different syntax. Let's print out uh, 20 digits of it. Percent 20 D. Comma. 82 subscript I. And then at the end of that, let's print out a new line. And it had three ones in a row. I can't say why. Notice that each number is 20 spaces apart because that's what this specified. And if we wanted to specify a certain number of decimal places, we could do like percent twenty dot five D. And it's not supposed to be a D. What is it really supposed to be? That was my mistake. F, right. So it's probably not all ones. I have no idea what it was actually supposed to be printing. Let's find out. I have to use LF for dumb. Yeah, LF is long Well, that's better. Isn't that what you're supposed to do, LF? Or does it not matter? I thought, I thought it was LF. Well, I think you're right. Percent F is the, or at least one, correct format for a double. Well, fine, but you're correct. It's supposed to be LD, excuse me, LF, but you can leave it out too. Percent F works both for floats and doubles, just like percent D works for both ints and longs. But shouldn't you use percent LD? For longs, don't remember. Anyways, why don't we be correct? All righty, so it, it printed out all zeros. Apparently, the floats are being set to zero when it's created, whereas the ints were not. They were had that random data in it. I can't explain why. Let's uh, switch back to debug mode and see if that's still true. Yeah, that's better. Some sort of nasty garbage is in there. OK. All right. So we got into trouble because we didn't initialize it. I'm going to add an initializer to it and just initialize them all to 0. And that's prettier. So without some way of tracking the length of the array, we would get into trouble. We wouldn't know how long to print it out. Or if we were going to sum up all the values in the array, we wouldn't know how to many to add up. And we could try to calculate it with a fashion like that, but that only works if the array is declared in the same context, in the same scope as where we're pro trying to process it. Let's go hit our PowerPoint.
So what is an array? It's an array is a sequential collection of data elements of the same type. Now, if you were a Python guru, you may have realized that your list could contain data of any type. You could put ints after floats, after booleans, after strings, after whatever, all in the same list. Not true of an array. They have to all be ints or the all doubles or whatever. So they're referred to by a common name. They have just one name. One variable name, and they are differentiated from by each other by their index number, also known as a subscript. I believe our textbook always calls it an index number. If you're reading other textbooks, you'll see the word subscript. Same thing. I'll probably alternate between using the term. The elements of the array can all be of any data type, but they all have to be of the same data type. So an int is a four-byte data type. So if you create an array of 10 ints, it's going to be 40 bytes long. So they all share the same name in a, in a specific array. They all share the same data type. The individual elements are called, excuse me, each spot in the array is called an element. And you access them with their index number, also known as subscript. So that's how you declare it. You give it a type. Could be a type that you create, like a structure. You give it a name, and then you give it a size. Example, that's an array of 100 elements. You can access elements 0 through 99. So you access them by their subscript, their index. If you have an index of 20 elements, 0 through 19, with 0 being the first element, 1 being the second element. And that can kind of give you just a little bit of mental pause. I want to get the last value you know, in the array. It's 20 long. I should be able to do A20. No, that's 1 past the end. So in C, the subscript starts with 0, which means that you can go out to N minus 1, where N is the length of the array. So they are contiguous in memory. Now we don't know the memory address unless we print out the pointer. But say we have six bytes, excuse me, six ints. Since these are ints, each one is four bytes long. So somewhere out in memory, at this byte number, is the integer value for seven. And then four bytes later, there's the integer value for 62. Four bytes after that is the integer value for negative 12. Now, as far as C is concerned, an array and a pointer are the same thing. And that's kind of odd to think about. But I'll give you an example. We had this array here called AD, and it was three items long. We could print it out with a, a for loop that looks just like this. Or we could print it out using pointers. Let's print it out with a while loop. So i is equal to 0, while parentheses i is less than 3. I'm going to use braces this time. It's an array of uh, ints. No, it's an array of doubles. So print f percent d and then backslash t for tab, comma, ad subscript i. Now this 3 is hard-coded in there, and that's bad programming. We should have defined it as a macro or a constant or calculated the size of the array. We need to increment i, so plus plus i. Putting the plus sign in front of the i saves a couple of nanoseconds as far as the program is concerned while it's running. And let's print out a blank line at the end of it. That is one way to print the array. That's the normal way of printing the array. So if you want to print out the first item, first value, I'm just going to create a variable called v. I'm not going to even use it. The first element in that array is at index value 0. Now I'm going to declare a pointer to an int 
and set it equal to the address of that array. Except I'm not going to use the ampersand. An array already is an address. So int pa, pointer to the array. Except it's not an int, or it's a double. OK, a pointer to a double. Let's set it equal to the address of our array. pa is equal to ad. And if we wanted to find out what was in that first value, we would do that. That's position 0. If you wanted to make that explicit, you could do this, like that. What if you want the second value? Well, if you're using subscripts, the nice clean syntax, you do it like that. If you're using pointers, you do it like this. V is equal to star AD plus 1 in subscript. What if I have that wrong? That was supposed to be PA because that's a pointer. And then let's make this PA as well. And let's wait for the little spinny wheel to stop. Come on. All right. All right, I'm going to compile it just to make sure that that's not an egregious syntax error. And I guess I'll print out V at this point to make sure that it's right. Print F, percent D, backslash N. I guess I'll make it V equals percent D so I can kind of differentiate it from everything else. S star parentheses PA plus 1 in parentheses. Okay. All right. Since this is an un uninitialized array, It's not uninitialized. I think I'm goofing there. AD should have had the values 1, 2, and 3 in it. Yeah, or 1.1, 2.2, and 3.3. .3. All right. I made the mistake again. This is an array of doubles, so I should not print it out with D. I should print it out with F. All right, so print it out 1.1, 2.2, and 3.3. .3, and then when I try to print it out mm -hmm. by its uh, pointer, it goofed. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about why that didn't work. I think I'm going to just try that. See if that makes it work, and then I'm going to skip it. Because I like introducing the concept of arrays, but I don't want to waste the time. Even when it, I mean, the pointers when it goes wrong. Yeah, okay, go and skip it. Alrighty then, I'm going to delete all that stuff until I'm sure that I can demonstrate it accurately. Sorry about that, guys. You just had a D instead of an F. Oh, did you see what I did wrong? Yeah. Let me undo that. Oh, for Pete's sake. Yeah. Yep, yep, thank you. All right, my faith in the universe is restored. I'm going to uh, copy that print statement a couple of times. That prints out the first element. This prints out the second element. And this prints out the third element. Now you would much rather use subscripts, I would expect. But you can process them as pointers. As far as C is concerned, there's no difference between an array and a pointer. You can use them interchangeably. Anywhere you can use one, you could use that um, the same nomenclature to access them the other. Now, if it's just a pointer to an int, to a single value, a double, something like that, rather than an array, 
then there's no reason for you to use subscripts. But you could. You could always just reference it as subscript zero. Give you an example of that. Int star pi. This is going to be a index to a pointer. I mean a pointer to an int. Let's set it equal to the ampersand of i. We know that there's an int called i. And if we wanted to print out the value of i, whatever it was, and then this one is an int, I could do this. I could do i subscript 0. No, i pi subscript 0 because I want to use the pointer to it. That would work. It would print out whatever the value of i is. Let's set i equal to something to prove it. Above that, I'm going to do i is equal to 999. All right, so it did print out 999. But are you going to do it that way? Not unless you, know, you really want to. Normally, when you access a pointer to a single element, you use that nomenclature. Now, I'll just reiterate that every time I declare a pointer, I prefix the variable name with p. And then any time I use it, I use star p. If it was a pointer to a pointer and such things exist, then you would do star star. I would name it pp and star star. Here's what that would look like. Int star star ppi. ppi is equal to the address of the pi pointer. And then when I wanted to print that one out, I'm going to copy and paste this line. I would print out star star ppi. And it's OK if you're not totally getting pointers. But I want to keep nudging up against it just because it's terribly important. And all of this other stuff you will see in other programming languages, but pointers are very specific to C and C++. All right, and so both of those printed out I. You see what I did is when I declared a pointer to a pointer, I gave it a name of double PPs. And so when I accessed it, I put in two stars in front of it, one star for each P. Do you have to name your variables like that? No. If you do it like that, then other C programmers will recognize what you're doing. Are we all good, or have I lost people? Their, their code's no longer compiling and stuff like that. Wave your arm if you need typing time. You need me to come eyeball it. Let me come back there and look. So initializing a one-dimensional array and see the memory spaces are not cleared from their previous value when variables arrays are created. Now oddly in C++, if you create an array as a global variable, it does initialize it. If it's a local variable, it does not. I'm not sure that that's true of C, so let's just give this as a blanket statement, memory space is not cleared. So it is generally good programming practice to not only initialize your variables, but also initialize your arrays. You can do it during declaration. You can quickly initialize your entire array by giving a single default value. But don't be fooled. That single default value does not fill up the whole array. It just fills up the first one, and then the rest of them are set with 0. So if you put 6 there, the first element would become 6, and then the other 4 would still be 0. So here we have an array of length 5. We have set the first element to 1, 2, 3. The rest of them are 0. And so we set our index counter to 0. And while the index is less than 5, so it'll go 0 through 4, we're printing it out. Now we don't need to type this in again because we have uh, done this several times in code already. So that would have been the output. First elements, one, two, three. The rest of them, since no initializer list was given for the successive elements, would all be 0. If we left this number out, it would have been an array of 1, length 1. And then this would be a terrible idea. Going through and accessing those other elements would not be a syntax error, but they could crash your program. And they certainly are not displaying anything that you expect. You have no idea what data is stored 
after that array. So if this array is only one element long, you better only access the first element. It's up to you to guarantee that. It's not going to give you an error. A compilation error, I mean. So that's how you process it with a while loop, but it's bad programming. The magic number five should be defined as a constant or as a pound defined. Or the while statement should calculate the index. The length of the array is equal to the size of the array divided by the size of an int. Now I know that method works in uh, C++. I'm not terribly sure if it works in C, so I always just did the size of the first element in the array. I guess we're going to find out. I'm going to, I know I use size of up here. Could I have replaced this AD0 with the size of an int? Is that still good syntax? Yeah, okay. That's a cleaner way of doing it, eh? But does that only work if your array is an int array? No. It'll do it no matter what. That, uh, I, I totally botched. This would give me an invalid value. That's, this only works if it's an int array. Yeah. <laughs> Just like you said. It should be divided by the size of a double. And to eliminate the possibility that I'm going to mess up as bad as I just did, I'd rather do the first element in the array like that. Just for that purpose, I wasn't paying attention. The size of technique only works in the same scope where the array was declared. So, important, to handle arrays and functions, you should always pass the length of the array in as an argument. Otherwise, you don't know how many elements to process because you can't use size of in a function. Let's declare a function that does something with that, that kind of data. You know, we have all these arrays of doubles. I'm going to go down below all of this and declare a function. Well, great. I don't know why I have that much free space that will sum all the values. Let's write two functions, a sum and a print. So void sum double array. And double DA square brace in square brace. Wait, if it's a sum, we shouldn't declare it as a void. We should declare it as a double so we can return a value. All right, we need some counter as an index. I'm going to use i, my favorite index variable. Int i is equal to 0. 4, i is equal to 0. i is less than the length of the array. Oh, no, I don't know the length of the array. I have to pass it in. I can't use size of because this is being passed in as a parameter, and size of does not work in that case. So int len, whatever you want to call that variable. So i is equal to 0, i is less than length, len, i plus plus, or plus plus i. I forgot to declare a sum variable to hold all the values added together. So I'm going to go up above my for loop and declare a sum and set it equal to 0. My accumulator contain all those values. And then in here, sum plus equals da subscript i, each element in turn. And then we can return the sum. I seem to have a mistake there. I haven't spotted it yet. Oh, anybody see what I did wrong? It's a pretty dumb, dumb mistake. Put I put a comma. That should be a semicolon. Since I'm putting all this code below my main function, if I wanted to call it from main, I would have to declare prototypes. So I could put that in a header file, or I could just put it above main. All right. It's just an array of doubles. No, I mean like um, 
Like normally, last time we made a function, we called it an int. So does it have to do with the value that's being returned? How does that work? Oh, oh. Yeah, if that was an int, it would be converted to an int on the way out. But it's an array of doubles, so I don't want that conversion to happen. I don't want to truncate it and lose the data. So I'm declaring it, and maybe I'm not answering the question. I'm declaring it as a double because these are doubles. And so when they're all summed up, the data type that I'm returning is double. So that's what I want to return. OK, so when you make your function, if it's returning something, it should return the same type. Right, right. If you want it to return an int, you declare it as an int. So if we were going to write a function that would add two longs together and return the result, long add two long long x comma long y we declare a result or a sum or something like that long sum sum is equal to x plus y return sum if this was supposed to be adding ints I would return an int that's weird I never noticed it but it's like in it's like functions are just like variables. Yeah, they are. So, um, except they're variables that can execute a block of code. But the way they're defined is very similar. Except you can have a variable. Excuse me, you can have a function that doesn't return anything, in which case you declare it as void. You can declare a pointer to a void, but I do not believe you can declare a variable that is void. That would be almost absurd. Yeah. And I'm not a pointer to a void. I'm not sure when you would use it. I can come up with one thing, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. Okay. So if we're going to print our array, we would pass in both the array itself and we would pass in as a variable array length. Now, if you had defined pound defined array length right as a uh, as a constant somewhere then you might be able to get away with it but that would assume that that function was written only to process that very specific array that that length was defined for it's far better to just pass it in The title of the slide is wrong. This has nothing to do with initializing it. We're printing the array, and we're calling the print array function here. In fact, I probably have that title wrong in several different places. I need to remind myself. Size of. Determining the size of an array. Initializing one-dimensional arrays. Passing arrays into functions. That's what that is. So, like, when you uh, start your C program and you do your int name, can you do things like double name? Let's find out what the compiler has to say about it. In Microsoft C, I know you de you can declare main as void. Yeah, I've seen that before. Void main. Or I've seen people like put void inside main. I don't know why. <laughs> that would be interesting. I'm not sure why you would do that. Is that bad syntax here? Nope. I guess that's just saying we're declaring a function and it's not accepting any data type, which seems superfluous because it's already going to assume that if there's nothing between the parentheses that it's uh, not got any data there. Well, Microsoft's not giving us any grief about it, so it could be that you could declare it as uh, being of any type. The reason we return an int is so that if we call it from a script, from bash or you know the command prompt or something, we could check the return value. And if it's returning a double, I have no idea if that gets passed back to the script correctly or not, or if the operating system is expecting it to return an int. Does that work? Hmm. 
Seems to. So traversing the array in the function. These look like identical slides. Delete one of them. You just use your while statement or a for loop. You increment your counter. You access it by the parameter name followed by the index value. And you just make sure that the index value never equals or exceeds the length of the array. If you're handling a string, you can depend upon the idea that a specific value will eventually equal zero and you could stop it there instead. So strings are character arrays. You could declare a string like this. Or you could declare, I mean, e either syntax works. You could declare it like that. The C compiler will turn it into this syntax where you're giving a series of characters to fill it in. And this is just showing, again, that an array is the same thing as a pointer. And this is a really, you can stare at that for a while and try to figure out what it's doing. I'm not going to work through it, how that's actually working. Why does this actually, well, yeah, it's worth talking about a little bit. Why does that while statement work? It looks completely alien. We don't have an index. We don't have a subscript counter. So what is star PCH doing? It's checking each element in the array. When will star PCH not be true? When it's, void. when it's equal to zero. And so that's the end of the string. So when star PCH is pointing to a null element in the array, then it will exit the while loop. But you can only do that kind of shenanigans if you have an array that you are sure is zero terminated. If you wanted to write your own stringlin function, it would look a lot like that. There are other string functions as well, like string copy, strcpy. Copy the uh, one array into another, well, one string into another. You have to be real careful though. You have to make sure that the array that you're copying into is as long as is necessary to hold the array that we're copying from. Otherwise, it'll write past the end of the array. C++ does not check anything like that. Now, there should be safe versions of all of these string functions, and I would have to Google them up to, to remember their name, where you can say, okay, string copy, but then you also specify the maximum number of characters to copy, and so it won't go over that. Can you not just make an array and set it equal to the other array? If you do that, then you have two pointers to the same array. And that's a very, very, very good question. Like, check this out. Come down here. Let's create, right above our pause, let's create a string. We already had one called name, I think, but let's declare another one. First name is equal to Bob. Care, last name is equal to first name. In C++ that would work. It would copy it. If this was of type string, actually, not of a character array. In C++ there are very different things. You have a string class which makes handling this kind of stuff much easier. All right, and then let's play. Let's set the first character of the last name variable equal to a point. And then let's print out first name. Print f, first name equals percent s because it's a string, backslash n, end quote, comma, first name. Is it going to print out Bob? It is not. It's not going to print out anything because I have a syntax there. Apparently, I have a lot of uh, errors. Stringling is an unsigned int. 
I is assigned int. And so it's giving me a warning about that. And here I declared int v as an int and I was copying some doubles into it so I was getting some warnings about that. I guess I'll clean up some of these warnings as I'm going along. But where's the error? Here it is. Array equals curly braces. All right. I wasn't expecting to see that error. OK, it's going to work if I declare it as a pointer, but that wasn't really the point. I think you saw, though, that at the very least, it was a syntax error. We could not copy it like that. That does not do a copy. If it was letting me do what I was hoping it would do, which is, uh, anyways, they would wind up pointing to the same thing. The only way I'm going to be able to get this to work is to declare first name as a pointer. And then I can get that to work. But I wanted you to see it work with arrays as well. And so now what happened here? Last name is pointing to first name space. So when we change the first character of last name, it's really just changing the first character of the first name array. So when it runs, it's going to print out dot ob. So there's or something no way, different. There's not an easy way to just copy your array. No. Well, when we say easy, there's probably a library for doing it. Array copy C library. Copying strings and arrays. OK, there's one called mem copy. Mem copy will do a copy of an array. That's good news so that you don't have to write your own copy function every time you want to copy the data over. Now, when you were doing Java, that syntax um, you know, last name equals first name is totally legal. They still wind up just pointing to the same memory address. But that's okay in Java because strings are immutable, meaning that you can't change the contents in the middle of a string. If you need a new string, if you need to alter it, you actually create a you know, new string space. So you can't get any weird side effects like that. But in general, anytime you have a reference type in Java, and arrays, since they are classes, and strings, and any other kind of class is a reference type. If you just use the equal sign, it doesn't do a copy of the contents. It just sets both of them equal to the same pointer. That's true of Java. Now in C++, you can do what's called overriding the operator, the assignment operator. And you can make the assignment operator in C++ actually do a full-fledged copy of your data across the equal sign. So when we assign when we initialize a string, you can do it with the convenience syntax, or if you want to treat it as a series of bytes, which underneath it all is, it is a series of characters, you can initialize it like that. But we have to include the zero at the end. That zero is at the end of that. It's just that we don't see it. The compiler adds it for us. All righty, traversing the array in a function. I'm going to delete that comment because that I actually moved the uh, stuff about pointers to the very end. This is just a function for stepping through it, printing it out item by item. Same function as we have written up here, except we call it something different. Entering data. You can read data into an array. You're just accessing it the same way, like that. And that will store the value from scanf 
into that element of the array. You, you remember you said the array is the pointer, so you don't have to use the and? You, you could get away with um, writing it like this if you wanted to. That would treat it like a pointer. Right, right. So, since this is an int, since a subscript i is an int of itself, we do have to pass it in like that. If it was a string, we wouldn't have to pass it in like that. If we were going to read in an entire value into a string, because a string is a pointer. But this isn't a string. So you read in your data using the ampersand, followed by the name of the array, followed by the subscript. Then when you print them out, it's just going to be the same business. You don't use the ampersand, of course. Ampersand is just for passing things into scanf, unless it's a string. And I never have figured out why you can pass it in with the ampersand, like you were suggesting, if it was a string, because that's not correct. So if we have an array of floats, the first element is 0. The last element is the length of the array minus 1. The length of this array is 3, so the last element we can access is 2. So uninitialized arrays can contain unpredictable data. We've already demonstrated this once. Why not demonstrate it with a character array, with a string? We're going to create a string, but we're not going to fill it with any data. So care, I don't know, ACH1 for an array of characters. It's going to be four characters long. Or five. We're going to stick the word Fred in it. No, we're not. We'll leave it alone at first. Now let's print it out. 4 i is equal to 0. i is less than 5. i plus plus. Print f percent c, end quote, comma, ACH1 subscript i. And then let's print out a new line after that. Print f backslash n backslash in. All right, look what it printed out. What are those characters? Well, let's print out the ASCII value of those things as well. So percent C, and then in parentheses percent D, and let's just print the same thing out twice. ACHI. Print out the ASCII value of the byte followed by the character representation of the byte. All right. Minus 52, minus 52, minus 52, minus 52. Let's print out the unsigned version of those. So I'm going to make a percent UD. That's not what I was expecting at all. Okay, obviously it's filled with garbage value, garbage data, and I'm not going to take the time to try to figure out what was wrong. Oh, you know when you, we uh, took that test and you had a question and it said uint on there? Apparently, they say uint is like a Microsoft thing and it's like GCC just uses unsigned in. Oh, my mistake then. I apologize for that. I used uint for the GCC version of it, I should have made it unsigned int. You are absolutely correct. And if anybody missed a question that involved a uint, I will give you credit for that. So eyeball your exam. And while you're checking for questions to ask about, look to see if there was a uint in it and if you got the wrong answer. So uint GCC. 
difference between uint and unsigned int? The first answer will be this question has already been answered. No. Nope. Yeah, uint isn't a standard type, unsigned int is. And what does this fact imply? That your GCC may happen to have uint, or it may not, but it will have unsigned int. Code written with uint won't be inherently portable unless you just do a type def unsigned int uint. So some systems may define uint as a type def just like that. For these systems, they are the same, but uint is not standard. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Let's go preview the quiz and see what questions I asked about that. I'm feeling really dumb at that point about that. Not on the first page. Okay. Not on the second page. All right, really? I think it's just the answer choice for one. Feel like it was on the first page, though. Seem like it, and if the search function's not finding it. When we go over it question by question on Wednesday. We'll, we'll spot it, or if you spot it, that'd be great. Okay. I could find it if I wanted to. I think we've had our, our fill of arrays anyway, so we're, we're going to wind up the class really soon. So if you want to change a value in an array that you already have one there, can you just do it with the subscript and then you just put equals whatever you want? Exactly. Every element in an array is just a variable. So if you want to change the uh, second element of an array and set it equal to 4, 5, 6, you do A subscript, you know, whatever the number is, 1 to get to the second element is equal to 4, 5, 6. What? Did I put it in a picture so that we can't see it? We'll it's find an answer choice. Oh, it's an answer choice, and, and Control yeah. F's not finding it buried down in the pull downs. What type can we use in GCC to define a four byte variable? If you got 22 wrong, I need to give everybody credit because there's no correct answer. UINT might work, but it might not work because it's not defined necessarily, it's not part of the C standard. Now, I'm not going to give them for the other ones, just because I used uint as a possible answer. It's only the one where it actually was the correct answer that everybody's going to get credit for. All right, let's talk about homework over arrays. Write code that will. Declare and initialize an array of 10 ints. Set the values of each int to successive digits of pi. So in other words, the first one would be 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9. Google it up to find the other four, etc., etc., etc. Write code that will print the array using whatever means necessary. You like while loops, you use, you like for loops, whatever. Write code that will add all the elements of the array and print the total. We have a sample of that. You could just copy the function, although I think I made it double. What else are we going to do with it? That's pretty paltry, but we're not done with the chapter, so...
I had a brilliant idea for a homework assignment as we were going through, and I've forgotten it. Unfortunate. Yeah, it's so sad. <laughs> Very sad. When you, were, when you were talking earlier, you said one-dimensional arrays, so you can have like bigger dimensions in your Exactly. Array. Like, what is tic-tac-toe? It's a two-dimensional array. Um, and you access each element by both its row number and its column number. Oh, is that how you make a matrix? Instead? Yeah, a matrix. So you could write matrix mass functions, you know, multiply two matrices together or whatever. And there are three-dimensional arrays, like if you're representing three space. Three-dimensional arrays? Yeah. It's like four-dimensional array. Yeah, if you're going to play tic -tac, 3D tic-tac-toe, you would need a three-dimensional array. And if you were going to store every single value, it would be a four-dimensional array. Yeah, yeah. You can create arrays of any... I don't know what the max number of dimensions it is. But the definition looks like this. You're right. A three-dimensional array is a list of lists, and defining them is not this easy. All right, that defines a, a two-dimensional array. This is the first row. This is the second row. And this is the third row. So if we wanted to set this element to a 1 because the player wanted to, you know, put an x there or something like that, then you would do tic tac, what row is it? It's in the third row, so that's row 2, 0, 1, 2. And what column is it? It's in the first column, so that's column 0, 1 and 2, so that would be a 0 is equal to 1 like that. Now my brain really can't parse anything more than 4 dimensions. I certainly have never written a program that I even used for a four-dimensional array, but you absolutely could use them. I don't know what the limit would be. To access, to step through a two-dimensional array, you use a nested loop. You know what, why don't... So I was doing this Java assignment the other day, Yeah. and I broke out of a nested loop by like naming the initial loop, but I don't think you can do that in C. There is not a, well, why don't we do it to see? Yes, Java lets you break out of a named loop. Remind me, does the name uh, begin with a colon? It probably ends with a colon. With yeah, so outer colon for i is equal to 3, i is less than 10, i plus plus if i is equal to six break outer yeah how about a go to this is horrible programming come on <laughs> you are not supposed to use go to's <laughs> because the language C predates the rules that you should not use go-to's. I want to break out of three loops at the same time. Like. Yeah, yeah, you could do so. You could do it that way. I guess we should make sure it works. Let's add a print in there. And then we'll stop it. I don't think I'm going to expand the homework assignment beyond what we've already got. So it may be really easy for you. Should have printed an outside of that thing. Excuse me. So it should print three, four, five, and six, and then stop. And that's what it did. Okay. 
So in Java, that should have worked. Did it work for you when you did it? Because yeah, I've done that in Java yeah, a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what we're talking about is a break statement will cause it to leave your loop. But it will only exit the innermost loop, whatever loop level you're in. And if you need break to pop out more than one level, you have to use named loops in Java. You give them a label like that, and then you can do break outer or whatever, and it would bail out all, out of all the loops. Now that's Java. I believe that's also C++, but I could be wrong about that. So instead, use a go-to, and uh, don't tell them that I showed it to you. OK. So why don't we stop, make a Dropbox, and all that good stuff. Any other questions? That's right, that's right, that's right. If you make every variable global, you don't have to define any parameters. That sounds really good. No, that's uh, 60s style programming. We're, we're cooler than that. That's exactly how old languages worked. The invention of local variables was a, a big deal.